Since the Japanese government announced earlier this week that elevated levels of radiation in Tokyo tap water meant that infants should not consume that water, they have since rescinded that instruction. They are telling people now that the water is fine. Two workers at the Fukushima Daiichi plant have now been hospitalized for radiation exposure after stepping into water that was radioactive while they were working to try to stabilize the plant. The junior level nuclear science we have all been doing to try to understand the news out of Japan and its nuclear disaster now also has to extend to the never before never before faced quandary um, of what to do with an uncontrolled nuclear reactor that is in essence packed with salt. They have been dumping in tons and tons and tons and tons of seawater into these hot reactors and these hot spent fuel pools. As the seawater boils off, it leaves behind salt tons and tons of salt. How will that salt affect the still continuing efforts to keep those reactors and those spent fuel rods from melting down? We are learning as we go on this. Joining us now to help us understand what we can about this continuing crisis is Dr. Michio Kaku. He's a theoretical physicist. He's also author of Physics of the Future, How Science Will Shape Human Destiny and Our Daily Lives by the Year 2100. Uh, Dr. Kaku, thank you very much for your time tonight. Glad to be on the show. Um, I mentioned the saltwater quandary because uh, of these fears that the salt from the seawater being used in desperation to cool down these reactors may eventually contribute to the risk factor um, at these reactors. Can you help us understand in layman's terms what's really going on here? Well, think of the little Dutch boy facing all these cracks in a dike. This hole, that hole, that hole has to be taken care of. We now have another hole in the dike, and that is the creation of salt. 90,000 pounds worth of salt in one unit because of the boiling of seawater. That salt encrusts the fuel rods like a cocoon, preventing cooling water from cooling the rod. When the rod hits 5,000 degrees, it starts to melt, hydrogen gas is released, and if there's a spark, you get a hydrogen gas explosion explosion which blows the whole spent fuel pond into the air. It's very similar to what happened at Chernobyl. In terms of that insulating factor of the salt, if they can switch over to fresh water for continued cooling efforts at these reactors, is it likely that that will, I guess, dilute that salt crust enough or, 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 or dilute the impact of what they've been doing with the seawater enough to undo some of that insulating damage that's been done? That's right. The hope is to use fresh water rather than seawater, but realize that they're making this up as they go along. Take any nuclear engineering textbook. Go to the last chapter for accident scenarios. This is not in the book. We're witnessing a science experiment with humans, us, as the guinea pig. They're literally making this up as we go along. We've never seen this before in a nuclear accident of this magnitude. What do you make of the news that power, electrical power, has been restored to the reactors? Are you able to tell enough about how much damage has been done to the systems that you would be hooking electrical power up to to know whether or not this is going to be a game changer in terms of wrapping this crisis up? The problem is that they have electrical cables going into the units, but they cannot turn on the pumps. In fact, they turned on the pumps at unit two and it didn't work. The problem is there's hydrogen gas and a spark by turning on the light switch could set off the hydrogen gas. So until they get the pumps going, we have to rely on the firemen. And nowhere in the textbook do they say that firemen, the local firemen, are the last resort to put out a nuclear accident. This is unprecedented. So we rely on the local firemen to put water on the site because the pumps are not yet turned on. It's very dicey. They're waiting to see whether or not they can turn on the pumps, and Unit 2's pumps didn't work. Inadvertently, um, tonight's show, we've talked about the BP oil disaster. We've talked about the Japan disaster. We keep talking about, um, we actually talked about safety problems at Diablo Canyon. Tonight's show has been all about making good policy and making adjustments in future planning to reflect past disasters. You are a futurist. You are a theoretical physicist. When you look at the situation in Japan, clearly there has been a lack of imagination about how much can go wrong. How do you think we ought to start to plan a safer future based on what's happened at Fukushima? 
The key mistake they made was not to plan for the once in a hundred year event. Engineers say, not in my lifetime, not in my children's lifetime, will we have the once in a hundred year event. Look at Katrina. That was not supposed to happen for a hundred years. At Fukushima, the walls guarding against the tsunami were only about 15 feet tall. The tsunami that hit was 25 feet tall. And then they put the generators in the basement. That is the fundamental reason why this thing spun totally out of control. All the safety systems got wiped out simultaneously, and that's not in the book. This is way outside the textbook that every nuclear engineer has to learn. We need new textbooks that are way more scary than the existing textbooks, in other words. Uh, Dr. Michio Kaku, theoretical, right. phys theoretical physicist, author of Physics of the Future, uh, thanks for helping us understand this tonight. Appreciate it. Is there any agency more save the world sounding than the National Nuclear Security Administration? In the aftermath of the Japan nuclear disaster, is there any agency less deserving of defunding from budget hacking Republicans in the House? Saving some money versus saving the planet and one of the most amazing political ads you have heard in a long time. Coming up next.